I just want to introduce myself. My name is Casey Harriet. I am the R3 coordinator for the Wildlife Department and National Wild Turkey Federation. Um, R3 stands for Recruitment, Retention, and Reactivation, which essentially that I help to create programs and initiatives to help get people outside, out in the outdoors, and hunting. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about a little bit about scouting, preseason scouting, over summer scouting, uh, and the things that come with that, like shed hunting and foraging that you might come across. Um, I have a special guest, um, Jacob Harriet, uh, Lincoln County Game Warden, uh, and also my husband. And he and I are both going to kind of tag team this presentation. So we're going to go through um, just the basics of all the, what I just mentioned, and then we're going to open it up for a Q&A towards the end. Uh, and so if you guys have any questions as you think of them, just type them in the chat box and then I will field all the questions at the end. And if we have a pretty small group, you know, I might just like let you guys ask your question, just unmute yourselves uh, and ask a question. But while we're doing our presentation, please, um, please do mute yourself. Um, and uh, I think we're going to get started now. So I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. Okay. So let me minimize this here. Okay. So today, like I said, we're going to be talking about scouting, shed hunting, and foraging. Um, predominantly, we're going to talk a little bit more about like the preseason scouting. Um, there's a couple opportunities still here today. I don't have a slide over it, but squirrel and turkey season. Um, turkey season is current. Um, it is from April 16th to May 16th. And then squirrel season opens up uh, May 16th or May 15th and then goes all the way to February, I do believe. So um, that's something that we can that we can talk about uh, while we talk about our preseason scouting and some of our shed hunting opportunities that happen as well as foraging. So, okay, first off, we're gonna talk a little bit about shed hunting. Um, just a little notes, and then I'm gonna kind of have Jacob kind of take it away here. Uh, the reason why you shed hunt, um, you, you can acquire, as a hunter, you can acquire a valuable information about animal behavior by finding their prey's antlers. Um, it also helps you to track deer throughout the years. If you are if you have private land and you're tracking, um, a deer from age one, two, three, and four, like you can, you can gather those antlers and kind of look at those and, and understand that that deer has been on your property where this, the, uh, where his habits are, um, how he, you know, converses across the property. And, um, it also is, you can enjoy the hunt itself and the reward of a remire, or admiring a fresh shed antler. Dogs love them. You can also sell the sheds, turn them into tools, artwork, rattling antlers for your next deer season. So um, it's a really fun thing to do in the summertime uh, when you uh, like to go in and see uh, what how the deer have been moving and stuff. And you're not really disturbing the deer because it'll be after season as well. So, Yeah, and it kind of depends on what part of the state you're in too, because a lot of times, like in my county, those antlers don't last very long. Uh, animals like mice and squirrels and stuff, they eat them. It's like a multivitamin for them. It's just a really dense in nutrients and, and minerals. Uh, so they eat them pretty quick. So getting out there right now, uh, you can find a lot of good fresh sheds. Uh, so uh, all the deer are pretty much shed now. It'd be kind of yeah. abnormal to have one holding on, but it's not uncommon. I mean, it, I it happens. I do mention that actually. Um, yeah, that they that they um, probably all drop their antlers a, a, by April. So yeah, usually, and yeah. some, some will hold longer, some will drop away early, but, uh, you know, the longer they sit on the ground, the more likely they are to get damaged or get ate up. Uh, you know, your dogs love them and so do coyotes. And, and I mean, everything likes to chew on them. That's why they're not, you know, just laying everywhere. But if you got, you know, the Western part of the state where there's not a lot of squirrels and stuff like that, uh, those antlers, you know, you can find antlers from multiple years, uh, you know, multiple past years. So when you're out looking for sheds, uh, what I like to do is basically all the information that I'm getting while I'm shed hunting. I'm, I'm looking to use that for my upcoming hunting areas. So, you know, if you want to hunt deer, you, you hunt them the same way that you hunt sheds. The, the only good thing is, is now the deer is not there to outsmart you. Uh, you're just looking for what he left behind. So you're not looking to be where the deer is going to be. You're looking to be where he's been. So areas like bedding areas, uh, feeding location, travel corridors, uh, you know, where they jump and, and jar those antlers, it helps a lot. I find a lot of shed antlers, uh, like along fence crossings and stuff, they're jumping over that fence and they're falling off or they're going underneath the fence and snagging them. Uh, and bedding areas, you know, a, a deer will usually bed in an area, get up, move around several times throughout the day and, and be in a very 
very confined area. He might make, you know, 10 beds in a 12 hour period, but he's going to be up moving around. That's very good chance that he's going to drop his sheds in there just by the sheer amount of time that he's spending. Uh, it's always good to take some binoculars uh, with you or just any sort of, you know, viewing glass in the fields. It, it'll help you pick them out. If you're out in, uh, you know, more open areas, you can take binoculars and scan, you know, like big ag fields and stuff like that and maybe pick those things up from a long ways away. Uh, and then, you know, if you have a dog that's uh, good at shed hunting, that's also a great strategy. It's also a fun activity. Any dog can shed hunt. So yeah. it's a fun fun thing to do with your yeah. your pupper and, and for kids and stuff too you know my my kids too he loves to shed hunt i don't have to worry about him being quiet and you know not scaring stuff off uh if he jumps something up and scares it off we go look in that area because it's a bedding area right you know you jump the deer up well that's where they like to bed so about, might as well go look for sheds there uh just a good way to get people outside that you know not necessarily in a a, a hunting you know situation and overall it just kind of gives you a a more in-depth um, idea of what your deer are doing on your property. Um, yep. Yeah. When I'm out there shed hunting, I'll, I'll be looking, you know, for rubs. I, you can still see some scrapes from last year uh, that haven't been completely covered up. Uh, any good sign, you know, figuring out where they're at. You, you know, you might find a water hole back in the trees you didn't even know was there. So just kind of keep in mind. I use uh, my mapping stuff, you know, I kind of document where, where certain things are as well while I'm out there looking around. Do you use Onyx? Yeah, I, I have Onyx that I use on mine, and uh, you, you know, if track. I if I find a scrape, I'll you know I can put a little pin on there that says there's a scrape or a rub. Same thing. Uh, we'll talk about some other sort of foraging in a bit, but some other species of plants. Uh, I also kind of pay attention to that, and uh, you know, kind of use that for my upcoming hunting season. I've also heard that when people are walking in a big ag field, they'll put that tracking uh, on there. Uh, on the onyx and so that they can track and see that where they've walked and make sure that they've walked like a grid to check and make sure they see all the antlers yeah. or come across all the antlers. Yeah. If, if you're big into it and you're wanting to make sure you don't, you know, go over your stuff twice, then you can, you definitely use that tracking feature. If you're like me, you probably walk by them the first time. So you might need that second time to go out there and find them. But uh, it's, it's all, you know, a technology. It's, it's really hard to beat. You can get pretty sophisticated with it. Yeah. Uh, preseason scouting, this goes hand in hand with what we were mentioning. Um, you typically are doing preseason scouting and uh, you, you're shed hunting while you do it a lot of times. So um, no matter what game you're after, spending time doing some preseason scouting will give you a good idea about what those bird or game numbers are uh, and where to be opening morning. Um, some of the reasons why you preseason scout is you figure out the lay of the land. I'm looking at aerials on a map can only get you so far. Um, boots on the ground is the best way to do it. Walking the train and seeing with your own eyes the animals and the sign um, in a non-hunting season. It's okay to disturb those animals and it's not going to be that big of a deal, but you really get to see what class of animals are on your property as well as numbers. Um, it's also really good to have a plan B, C, and D. So you always have a plan A spot, but sometimes that plan A might not work. Um, that's especially uh, true on public land. Um, but also, you know, you might have a bad wind or there might be some sort of uh, change in topography or something, especially in ag fields or whatever, um, you know, agricultural activities going on. So having a backup plan is always smart and kind of marking those on on uh, kind of your maps or just in mental memory of where you're at is always a really good idea. And then um, early season foliage, looking at vantage points with si and sight lines with the leaves on the trees, that's always really important um, because in early season when you're deer hunting, um, you're going to be in a tree full of leaves. If you have a tree stand up there, it's a really good idea to look at what type of um, uh, I guess, uh, sight lines you have and if there's anything in your way and, and kind of cut those and have an idea of what you're going to be looking at, especially with the tall grass and everything. You kind of just get an idea on the where the foliage is at during these off seasons, um, right before your early season hunts. Yeah. A and lot, trail cams as well. Yeah. A, a lot of times when you're out there, I, I love to scout, you know, in the, in the dormant season when there's no leaves and stuff on the trees and you can find some awesome stuff, but the benefit to this time of year is now that, like she said, the leaves are on the trees. So what might look like a great spot in the, uh, you know, in the dormant season, well, now with all the vegetation growing up, you can't see anything, you know, all those leaves are there, so you can't see. So it's a good idea to get in there and kind of pay attention to that. Another thing I was going to touch on while you're out there uh, scouting, a thing to pay attention to is the wind. Uh, so, you know, when we're hunting animals that smell good, like deer or your fur bears or anything along those lines, you, you don't want your wind blowing to them. And it's pretty easy just to look on your phone and say, well, there's a south wind today. You mean that have a good nose? Well, you said that smell good? 
as in like they they have they, yeah they have, they have a good sense of smell <laughs> okay uh, they have a good sense of smell uh so if it's a south wind and you go and hunt that for a south wind well a lot of these areas especially if you get in like dense woods and stuff the wind will swirl and do all sorts of crazy thing things so while you're out there scouting you can kind of pay attention look okay, like it's a southwest wind today this is what my wind's doing it's it's actually blowing straight west because of the terrain or it's it's blowing straight north in some some instances or it's swirling so bad that there's no way a deer would ever get close to you uh, so just some good things to to think about trail cameras are great too uh, a lot of people you know they have these cell cameras now that send the pictures of their phone you can go in there and set these cameras up this time of year and not go back to this time of year next year, you know, with some of the battery lives and you can put solar panels on them and all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, and you can get a lot of good data that way. And also, you know, just the card pulling cameras are, are great as well. Yeah. Do you want to mention um, it's tick season bad. And so when you're out in the woods this time, even earlier and through the summer, a good um, permethrin treatment on your clothes uh, is definitely something to consider because we're already pulling seed ticks off of each other or off of us when we're walking out into just like high grass yeah yeah the ticks are terrible uh i'm in the woods a lot the permethrin has been the best thing that i've found to work uh yeah i treat your clothes with that beforehand don't spray it on you like a you know an off spray you actually treat your clothes your boots your socks treat that, let it dry after it's dry, it's safe to wear and put that on you. That's the best thing I found, you know, tight clothing, uh, you know, something that has a band around your ankles and your waist and your, your wrists that'll keep those ticks from getting in there. Uh, you know, people put tape around their legs, just regular off bug spray works great. Some people will use sulfur and all, all sorts of stuff, but just, just be cautious of it. And, and the big thing is, is once you're out in the woods, uh, make sure you go home and you check and make sure there's no ticks on you. There's a lot of tick borne illnesses, uh, that you don't want any part of. So just yeah. make sure you get those ticks off. Okay. So while you're out there um, scouting after season, you might come across some things that you can eat. So uh, we want to talk a little bit about some of the the things that you can find out in the woods, what we call foraging. Sometimes we're a lot better gatherers than we are hunters. So uh, we've come across a couple of situations like that, where we've come across some persimmons or some plums instead of um the the animal we were chasing and so we were better gatherers that day but there's a couple different mushrooms here in Oklahoma that we want to talk about I think most notably is the morel mushroom everybody there you know we know there's a little window of time each year where these morels pop up um they're found to, um central to eastern part of the state um but they have a small window of time when they're available and we're closing that window now. Our, our house where we have our, um, some morels on our property, um, it, that, that window happens to be a little bit later for whatever reason than a lot of the, so we have probably a few left, if any, if we haven't gotten burned up by the sun right now, but they should all be kind of be winding down. But I always say, look for them uh, when the red blood buds start to bloom. That's a really easy uh, correlation of the time of the year that these guys are out there. And a lot of times they're found under uh, cedar trees or hardwood and in, in hardwood forests. Um, they can get massive and there's two different types of morels. There's the, the gray, which is a smaller, and then what our son right there is holding is a, a yellow or golden. Um, uh, and these guys um, notably are super tasty fried, but we have played around because uh, sometimes we get a lot in a short amount of time. And so we played around with dehydrating them and then reconstituting them in soups or sauteing them. They're all extremely good for you. Uh, it's good. And if you don't want that like super fatty friedness of it all but um, there's another option out there called the oyster mushroom and they are early fall to spring and um and they're available around north central oklahoma i have not really assembled across these but i don't know where who we're all tuning in from so this is a statewide class and so hopefully you guys maybe we might have some north central oklahoma people um but they're found um, on dead oaks and stumps as well and they're they're very tasty to put in soups and fried and pretty much anything you can do with a typical mushroom you can do with these guys too yeah. and I, I did want to preface this you know with these with these mushrooms make sure you know what it is before yes. you eat it uh, there's a lot of of mushrooms that are not edible uh so that are not only not edible but they're yeah, poisonous they can, yeah, they can be toxic as well yes. so just make sure you know what it is make sure you're with somebody that no, you know, can tell you, okay, yes, that is a morel. We do have false morels. Uh, if you know, if you can just do a little bit of paying attention, they're pretty easy to distinguish. The only ones I have experience with is the morels. I've never found the oyster uh, mushrooms or or the next ones we're going to talk about. 
But that's the big thing is, you know, make sure you know what it is before you eat it. They all have lookalikes or someone could think it's a lookalike anyways. Um, so another one uh, is the chicken of the woods, which is I have a friend that finds them down in southeast Oklahoma all the time. Very much an eastern Oklahoma thing. Uh, they grow on down oaks and other hardwoods and dead conifer stumps. Uh, they're available uh, summer and fall. And a lot of people uh, fry them up and they say they taste like fried chicken. And I have never gotten a hold of one to find uh, to taste yet, but I I'm looking forward to maybe doing that um, when we get down to Broken Bow. But uh, people say it tastes just like chicken. They use them as their actual source of, I don't know if it's necessarily protein, but they use it as uh, their chicken, you know, in their meals. Um, another one is sheep's head or hen of the woods. Um, so we got chicken of the woods and hen of the woods. I like to call them sheep's head because I think those can be kind of confusing if you were saying chicken versus hen of the woods. Um, but this is found in late summer and early fall, uh, predominantly in eastern Oklahoma. And they appear as a cluster at the base of oaks, dead trees, and stumps. Um, you can see right there. Uh, a lot of people call them hen of the woods because it looks like there's like a chicken sitting on a log or something. That was where that got the um, the name. Or woolly like a sheep's head as well. So. You can cover these ones. Uh, so foraging, some fruits that we have out there. Uh, so blackberries, everybody know what a, bla a blackberry is, but we have dewberries as well. So the the difference is, is the dewberries are more your woodland. They like they can grow very well in shade and uh, low light. And your blackberries are normally out in your big fields. The blackberries are usually much longer or larger and the dewberries are a smaller berry, but they're both delicious. They both taste great. Dewberries kind of trail. Too. Yeah, they're, they're like a more of a single viney species rather than a big, you know, bush like a blackberry bush would be. Uh, they fruit in the summer. We're going to have a great crop this year. They have really pretty white flowers when they bloom and those white flowers were everywhere. So it should be a really good year for dewberries and blackberries. Dewberries come a little bit before the blackberries too. So they ripen a little bit before the blackberries. They're more blackberries are a little bit later in the season. So you can kind of look for that first round of blackberries you see. Those are actually the dewberries and they're smaller. And then the blackberries will come when it's just a little bit hotter and more miserable to pick them outside. And they all have thorns. Both both um subspecies have thorns. Yeah, I, I've got a bunch I'm watching right now. They're they're about yay big and green right now. So they're growing. Uh, but they're they're an awesome fruit that you know is all summer long you can usually get them once it, it kicks off and gets warm uh another thing is sand plums so sand plums they're they're usually a shrub or, or they grow in like big bushes uh which the bushes are really just a shrub they're all grown together uh they're usually right from june to august and they make awesome jellies and jams uh, we also have another species of plum here called the uh, mexican plum and it's actually more of a tree uh, it grows in the woods and uh, we also had a really good flowering year for those. So I'm, I'm hoping we're going to have a bunch of uh, Mexican plums uh, come, you know, the fall. They, they ripen much later. Usually deer season, it's a good thing to keep an eye out for when you're scouting because those deer will, will key in on those when they start dropping in the fall. Uh, yeah. But they're both delicious, uh, good plums. You can use them um, to make jams and jellies. Um, both of these same, uh, or you can eat as is. They're they're great little treats uh, out in the woods. Our son eats them up, um, and when we're doing our little trail walks yeah. and stuff, we just grab a handful. And another thing to think about too is if if we like to eat them, that means you know other animals like to eat them as yeah. well. So when we're out there, we're scouting, we're getting ready for our hunting seasons. Uh, you know, deer love to eat blackberries. They love to eat sand plums, and not only do they eat the berries itself but they actually will browse on the stems and the leaves uh so even if there's not berries on it in the fall season they will nibble on that stuff and they get a lot of energy from those little twigs and buds and leaves off of them so it's a good food source to key into while we're out uh you know have that ready for us when we're hunting heard also that sand plums are like a good place uh, for quail to hide yep yeah it's good brush brush cover for quail so uh, we call those mots when they're in like little groups together that's what um we when we say mots that's what that is and those are often really good uh, cover uh, habitat for yeah for yeah quail. for birds rabbits uh really everything they yeah. can they can get in there they're they're safe from overhead predators so they're hawks uh they're hawks owls stuff like that and then you know a coyote doesn't really want to go running through one of these bushes he will but he's got to be pretty hungry for him to do it. So just yeah. provide some cover, some shade, you know, in the summer when it gets real hot. Uh, so some, some other ones are persimmons. Uh, so this is a thing this time of year, the persimmons aren't, aren't ripe. They're really just leafing out, but their, their, uh, their bark is very distinct. It's like a really black blocky uh, pattern. 
uh, these are a great food source when they're ready for deer, uh, as far as deer hunting and anything really, you know, raccoons, coyotes will eat them a lot. Uh, they have a, a great big kind of round, almost looks like a pumpkin seed. And you'll find that in a lot of scat when you're out walking around when they're ripe because everything is keying in on them and eating them. So they usually ripe, uh, ripen after the, the frost. They actually have a, the way they grow, if the, you eat them when they're not ripe, they, they'll make your mouth pucker, uh, the Indians used to use them as like, you know, pain medicine. If they had a bad tooth, they would dry them out and they could put it in there because it would make it go numb. Uh, so if you ever eat one that's not ripe, you'll remember it. You'll know. <laughs> yeah, they, they're very distinct. But once they're they're ripe, they're just sweet. Mushy sweet. Yeah, they're so good. I love them. And they're good for like fall baking. I say I'm making jellies, breads, and other baked goods. It's definitely a taste of kind of fall. Um, kind of goes along with like pumpkins and your like all spices and your nutmegs and all that fun stuff. Um, they I made some really good um spiced persimmon bread. Yeah. One time and but that was great. They kind of just have a really sweet cinnamony almost taste to them. Yeah. And they're delicious. Like I said, it just tastes like fall to me. Yeah. Um, and it it you know we. We're talking about summer and spring foraging here, but I wanted to add this in here because once again, if we're talking scouting as an overarching um, topic here, then identifying these guys and knowing what to look for the, the, if you look, if you find one persimmon, you'll find a, a few persimmons. They're not just by themselves um, most of the time, uh, but they do have that really blocky um that bark that is good to look for when you keep in mind um, where you want to go later in the year for after that first frost hits yeah. um, for hunting. And I promise if there's persimmons out there and they're ripe, there will be deer yes. using that. Uh, I mean, it's just a, it's just a, a magnet form, uh, but they're really, really good, good for you and for the deer. If, if you don't get a deer, at least you can go eat for some persimmons. Yeah. Uh, another thing is wild grapes. So they're statewide. Uh, a lot of times you don't see them. So in our area, we have uh, just grape vines, but there, there's these great big vines that climb way up in the trees. And those vines will only produce grapes off old wood. So so like the new growth, they won't produce any on. So usually these grapes are way up high in the trees and you really never see them. The birds that eat them before they get to you. But if you find an area where those vines are on a tree that maybe fell down or they've grown so long that they're dangling down. Uh, these grapes are, are, they're edible and they're really delicious. Uh, as a kid, we always call them possum grapes. But there's you, a bunch of different varieties. So I was doing my research yeah. on this. There's, there's probably 15 to 20 different varieties that mm -hmm. we have here in Oklahoma. Um, not all native, but they're here. And they, would you say that they could almost be kind of invasive? Like in a way is like how they're, we have them on our crepe myrtles and it's pulled the entire crepe myrtle down. Yeah. I mean, they, they can cause some damage to your yeah. trees, but I mean, it, they're 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 a native species they're they're meant to be here yeah uh but i wouldn't say they're invasive no but but they can't they can't harm trees if in you know extreme extents but uh the the musk and dime grapes i don't have a lot of experience with those but eastern oklahoma that's big and that's you know they make wine they make jellies and jams it's all yeah. all really good stuff here we don't have those but we have these smaller you know what i've always called possum grapes yeah and they're good they kind of have a big seed in them but they have a you can eat the seed it's not bad and my kid loves them. He, uh, he'll eat them when they're dried out too. So this time of year, uh, the ones from last year that didn't get consumed are dry and he loves eating those things dry, like little wild raisins. So, yeah. And, um, also there are a poisonous, uh, lookalike to this. So make sure you ID, um, a even like pokeberry and stuff will kind of look like this. Yeah. Um, so just make sure like when you put it in your mouth and you, it's not sweet, you'll know <laughs> if nothing tastes like a grape, um, that that isn't supposed to be a grape, I guess. So just make sure uh, you do your ID um, before you go and possibly, you know, make yourself sick. You want to talk about a few other? Oh yeah, let's yeah. talk about like mulberries. Yeah, so green a few other species. Well, while we're talking about polk, polk. so polk is yeah. a uh, it's just an annual uh, a forb that grows every year. It's an amazing deer. Deer love to browse it. It puts off uh, berries that are, look it's very similar to these grapes, but they grow in a different pattern. Oh, They're real squishy. Uh, but that, that's a very important food for birds and stuff. Right here. But the leaves you can actually oh, eat them, boil and you boil them twice uh, because they are toxic if you don't. And when they're boiled down, they're a lot like spinach, like canned spinach. Mm -hmm. It's it's very good. Uh, another one is mulberries. So a mulberry tree is just a tree. Uh, if you like to squirrel hunt, uh, mm -hmm. when the mulberries are ready, the squirrels will be in there very very heavy. Uh, so it's a good thing to keep an eye out for when you're scouting. They have a real unique leaf on them, and their their bark's also pretty easy to distinguish. But the berries are amazing. I love them. 
the leaves are kind of like a dinosaur foot. Yeah, yeah. I would say dinosaur foot. Like a dinosaur foot was a good way to describe them. But a unique tree. It definitely stands out am amongst a bunch of oak trees for sure. Um, let's see. The green briar. The so green briar. Uh, so that thorny, nasty vine that you hate running into. Well, the fresh sprouts on that are uh, are almost identical to uh, like a... Oh, shoot. What am I you thinking? You said asparagus. asparagus. Yeah, they're very asparagus-like. So they grow up. You just snap off the tops of them. Uh, my kid loves to eat them, too. Uh, I'll eat them as a snack. Uh, once they're not tender anymore, of course, they're not any good. They, those spines will harden on them, and they're really bad. Uh, but the greenbrier, just as far as scouting goes, greenbrier is an amazing deer food. They will eat that 365 days a year. It it's, holds its you know protein content, so it's a very nutritious food. I actually keep an eye out for like green briar uh, mats and stuff where there's a bunch of it. Once it grows up into the trees so tall that it, uh, it they gets out of reach and they can't use it. But I do a lot of control burning, so they it will basically make new sprouts every year, and the deer will just hammer them down. Uh, but that's a great food source in the, in the fall and late winter. They'll they'll eat a lot of green briar, so a good thing to keep an eye out for. Yeah, and a few other things that I didn't um, I didn't add in this were a dandelion. Um, dandelion, everybody knows what a dandelion looks like, but people make tea out of that. They're super, super high in antioxidants and lots of good nutrients for you. Um, people will actually fry them up. If you didn't know, they'll fry them up and dip them in ranch and it's yummy. Um, you can also use uh, yarrow, which is growing right now. Um, and this is something that you just common yarrow you look it up it is like a ferny plant yeah. um it people use them for poultices or tinctures um or just as a tea um it is really good for upper respiratory infections and stuff uh, to drink as a tea um and it has like this ferny leafy leaf and like long tall stem with a um white head of flowers and they're starting to bloom right now as well and those are all kind of like more the herbal side of things but um the dandelions that's that's definitely a delicacy a lot of people will, like i said mix them up in some flour and fry them up you know us oklahomans we try to fry everything so and the, the last one and there's there's way more than we're covering yes. out there it just depends on your knowledge base to uh, you know know what they are know how to id them and know how to eat them correctly but uh, red buds are state tree uh, yes. the, those blooms in their past now but those uh, those blooms are edible and people make a lot of jellies and stuff out of them as well. And it's also great deer food. So the deer will eat the uh, the twigs and buds on those red buds a lot. So good to, good to know for your scouting and also good to know for a snack. Yeah. Anything rich in color like that, those blackberries or the mulberries or anything that is dark reds um, are super high in antioxidants. That's one of the um, that's one of the key features of antioxidant rich food is the deep purple color so uh, we do need to talk a little bit about the laws and what's legal and what's not legal to do on our public lands here um so i'm gonna let the lawman do that real fast okay. i'm gonna read to you word for word what it says in our, in our law book as far as foraging goes on wmas so it shall be unlawful to cut any living tree shrubs or other woody vegetation for use as camouflage blind stands or firewood fallen dead trees may be used but shall not be removed from the department managed lands. It shall be unlawful to remove any uh, or, or historical, cultural, or archaeological artifacts, including arrowheads, uh, from department managed lands. It shall be unlawful to cut, dig, damage, or remove any crops, trees, shrubs, timber, including dead standing trees, water, gravel, sand, earth, rock, mineral, or other natural resource other than legally harvested fish and wildlife from the department managed lands without prior written approval from the department. Removal of such resources from the national forest lands is subject to the regulation of the U.S. Forest Service. So that being said, you know, uh, the foraging, you can't do it on WMAs. Uh, you can uh, harvest sheds. You know, if you find sheds, you're more than welcome to take those. But our public lands, there's just so many people and so much demand that we, we can't just be removing all those resources all the time. Uh, it's, just, it's not sustainable in that way. So it, it is against the law to do that. And I just wanted to make sure you guys know that. Yeah, we also talked about preseason scouting. Um, a lot of most WMAs are open to preseason scouting, but each WMA has their own special restrictions. Um, some have camping areas, some are closed during non hunting times, or um, just, and it'll say if you look at our reg book, it'll say, um, it'll it'll show you special regulations on each one of our WMAs. So, um, definitely want to mention that. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Like, like she said, it, just whatever WMA you're going to or public land area, make sure you can talk to them about it. And uh, 
you can either call and ask or it'll say specifically what you can and can't do on there. Uh, like the camping, for instance, a lot of WMAs do not allow camping. Some of them allow camping anywhere. Some of them allow it next to, you know, open roads. So just make sure whatever area you're going on, you make sure. My county, I do not have any public land at all. I don't deal with public land very, very much at all. So whatever county you're going to, that game warden's number is listed. The biologist number is also listed. Make sure there's not an unknown in there before you go and accidentally break the law. Just you have the opportunity to, you know, figure that out. Also on, uh, you know, municipalities and, and other city properties and stuff like that those cities will be in charge of that land. So make sure that you can talk to one of them and make sure that you're good to go. And if it's not clearly posted and you have questions about it, if you don't know if you can or can't do it, you better find out before you go in there. You might be trespassing. You might be thieving. Uh, you, you never know. So just make sure beforehand. Okay. So we're going to open it up to question and answer now. Um, we do have one question here. What about trail cameras? What do you recommend? Uh, Lincoln, are, are you looking for like brands of cameras or strategies for cameras or, or what are you looking at? Do you want to unmute yourself? We got a pretty. Um, I'm looking for brands. Brands, you know they're they're all pretty good. Uh, trail cameras are like anything else; you can spend as much as you want or as, as little as you want. I I will say uh, that some of your cheaper ones will not perform as well as your your better ones. A lot of times, uh, like heat and wind, for instance, will set the camera off. And you might, you know, get a thousand pictures, your card fills up and your batteries die, just taking pictures of leaves blowing around. Uh, but a lot of that can be corrected by just how you set the cameras up. It, it's always good to face those cameras to the north because you're not having that southerly sun because that sun will set them off occasionally. Mm -hmm. uh, brand wise, I really don't have a recommendation for brand. It's just kind of personal preference. Uh, they usually all work pretty well. I've never had one that just absolutely didn't work. Uh, but there is differences in quality, you know, based on the, the price point normally. Okay. If anybody else has any questions, you can just unmute yourself and ask. We have a, like I said, a pretty small group, so you can make this pretty intimate if you'd like. Uh, hey, my name, uh, uh, am I too loud? You got an echo. echo. Okay. I don't have effects on or anything. I got a classroom full of sixth grade boys. Uh, and I got one here with a question. Okay, okay. Perfect. perfect. Great. What is the best climate? What is the best climate for deer? Climate? The best climate for deer? Yes. 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 Uh, so, so deer are super adaptable. I mean, it, it's amazing. You know, the deer pretty much you live across the United States, uh, into Mexico and into Canada, they're very adaptable. I don't know that there's one climate that is better. Uh, if you look at, you know, where big deer are, you know, the, the bigger the antlers are or whatever, usually that's a sign of, of good quality habitat. And that usually starts with the soil. So areas like Iowa that have a lot of sunlight to the ground and they have very fertile soils from, you know, years of the, the great plains, and being, you know, just grazed by bison and trampled in and really healthy soil, the healthier that soil is, the, the better the deer are going to pick up nutrients from it. Uh, but really, the deer can live just about anywhere. They can live out in the, you know, in Canada, in the forest out there, or they can live in your neighbor's backyard, you know, chewing on their shrubs. So I don't know also, if there's a correct temp climate. Temperature too, um, like a lot of times deer are going to be, when they're cold, like super cold outside, they have to keep moving. So yeah. maybe touch a little bit on that. And that could have also been what he was asking. Okay. Temperature so, wise. so temperature wise, uh, usually the colder areas, those animals are going to be bigger uh, in hotter areas. Those animals are going to be smaller. So like the, if you took a deer from Mexico and a deer from Canada and put them side by side, they would almost look like different species. Uh, they're just uh, how their body adapts to that climate. Uh, really temperature wise, it, it doesn't really matter. It's it, it just whatever that deer is adapted to, and they do very well adapting to different situations. So, like I said, I don't know that I could say there's a one climate that's better than the others, just because they're so adaptable that those animals in that area have adapted to that over, you know, however long those species have been there and uh, do very well on it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> You might have to mute yourself. We're getting the echo pretty bad. Does Bushnell cell cameras have performed well, but you pay a cell 
but you pay sell per camera. Tacticam has a better app. You definitely get what you pay for. I've used a Tacticam reveal for a few years and it's been great. $5 a month for sell coverage. Yeah. And, you know, you can spend as much as you want on them or you, you can go to Walmart and buy one for $30. And yeah. uh, if, if Lincoln, if you're just getting into it, it would probably be good just to get one of those uh, cheaper cameras and just play around with it. You can make a cheap camera do really good things if you set it up right. And all that just comes from experience with them. But like I said, pointing them to the north, keeping them out of the sun, keeping limbs and stuff that's going to blow in the wind out of it, putting it on bigger trees that the tree isn't actually going to move in the wind will all help you out a lot. Yeah. Any trees you recommend for plant uh, attracting deer? Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm a native guy fan. So, you know, any of your native tree species are going to be beneficial. A lot of people will, will plant these, you know, hybridized trees or, you know, deer or trees per, made to produce bigger fruit or better fruit. All that's great. But if you get a drought or maintenance wise, the, your native trees are going to do better. Uh, you know, they really eat everything. Your, your oak trees, they'll browse on. And of course, they have the acorns that they eat as well. There's a bunch of different varieties of oaks. So depending on what part of the state you're in, uh, you know, you might plant a live oak or you might plant a blackjack oak. Uh, normally, in, in most instances in the state, and there are some exceptions to this, normally you will do a lot better removing some trees than planting more trees. Most of our forests are overstocked with timber and the trees that are there are not healthy. And if they're not healthy, they don't produce as much fruit. Uh, so like our oak trees, most of our forest around here in central Oklahoma, you can remove half the trees and increase your acorns by 50% just by getting more sunlight to those trees and making them healthier. Uh, if you have specific tree questions, I, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, let's see. Also, um, if you think about if you're going to try to plant a couple different varieties of uh, trees for deer um, browse, like your acorns are going to be your later season hard mast. Um, your persimmons are going to kind of be something that would happen more early season. So, you know, kind of strategically keeping that in mind, um, if you're going to pick and choose what you want, your early season um, foraging versus your later season foraging for deer is something to kind of keep in mind as the season progresses. Those persimmons may be gone, but they might have those acorns dropped and, and ready to eat still. So something yeah. to think about. Uh, Krista said the Oklahoma Forestry Department has great deals on native tree packages. They do. Uh, they're very cheap. Uh, they're bare root seedlings. You know, they're they're pretty small. You can buy a bunch of them and plant a bunch of them. Uh, when you're doing that, I would recommend plant those trees where they should be. Uh, if you take a persimmon tree and put them up on a dry hilltop, they're probably not going to do as good. Uh, persimmons like moist soil. Uh, you know, same with oak trees. If you put a, you know, a, a say you put a blackjack oak in a swamp, it might not do that good because there's too much water. Uh, so make sure you're putting those where they go. Um, another thing is, is a lot of the trees, like we talked about, once they get above the the height of a mouth of a deer they're pretty useless to a deer uh red buds is a really good example so red buds once they get big they're pretty useless for deer but if you do control burns they'll put out a lot of uh, like root sprouts and stuff so if you're on our public lands we do a lot of burning if you find a red bud tree that has a bunch of bunch of little shoots coming out the bottom of it the deer will browse on that all winter long so it makes really good uh deer browse and a lot of species will do that elm hickory i mean really all the species will do that I know some states don't allow wireless cell cameras on public lands. Is there any laws concerning that here? Uh, no, the only thing with our public lands is anything you put on it needs to have your name and uh, customer ID number on it. Uh, so basically make sure you have it labeled with your stuff. Cell cameras are legal. Uh, regular cameras are legal. Uh, you're not supposed to screw anything into the tree. So make sure you're using a strap and then, you know, be, be smart about it. If you leave it out there a long time, either that strap's going to break and fall off and look trashy. Uh, you know, at a certain point, those cameras become litter. Uh, so just make sure you're, you're monitoring it, keeping up with it, and then have your information uh, clearly wrote, written on those cameras. Any suggestions for planting green fields, types of plants, et cetera? Uh, Casey, it really depends on your environment uh, and, and when you're wanting to plant, uh, you know, different seasons. Like right now, we're kind of out of the spring planting area. We're looking into our summer forages. Uh, me personally, I'm about to plant some cover crop mixes. I like to use mixes uh, that have a bunch of different species in it. You don't want just, you know, one species of grass unless, you know, you're harvesting that for an ag crop. But anytime you can get a diverse mix of species in there, it'll do a lot of good. I think the mix that I'm about to plant, it has like sorghum sudan, millet, uh, sun hemp, sunflower, uh, some legumes, some clovers, some peas, uh, 
a lot of vetches and stuff. It, it, it just really depends on your area. Uh, I hope that helps. It's kind of a generic, generic answer, but it really depends on what area you're in and what, you, when you're planting it. Um, best areas to find sheds. Uh, in my experience of all the bedding covers, the, the like grazing areas, I, the best, um, place for me to look for them is if you know of a trail that they have to jump, like we said, something about being jarring or they have to go under something. Um, because that's where I found the sheds or been in like openings of trails where they've had to like duck to go into and stuff. And usually that'll just rip an antler off when it's close to falling off anyways. So I would definitely look for those, you know, ditches, ditch crossings, et cetera, that you'd have, they would have to jump across, um, or, kind of go under fences and stuff. Yeah, that's definitely the cherry picking spots. Yeah. You know, you can spend a lot of time in a bedding area with really thick, nasty cover, or you can just run around the, the edges of the property where they cross the, the trails. Uh, any place that deer spends a lo spend a lot of time or they're very concentrated is good spots. So like mm -hmm. she said, any sort of crossing, it could be a creek crossing. It could be a, a heavily uh, area where they feed, you know, like a food plot or, you know, an ag field. Or great spots to look and then those bedding areas they spend a lot of time in uh, it's usually thicker uh, areas and harder to you know get in and look around in but it's, it's a very good uh, spots to look uh lincoln asked a question and we got a good answer here for it uh lincoln yes so those auctions are awesome so lincoln if you've never been to a fur auction they uh they're great there's a lot of good people with a lot of trapping wisdom uh you can learn a lot just from going to these things but every year Oklahoma Fur Harvester has their auction. Uh, there used to be three, now there's just one, uh, but you can go there. All these fur buyers will come down and buy uh, buy the hides, and then they take them off uh, to these bigger auctions. Uh, if you're doing bobcats or otters, make sure you get them tagged. Uh, you can call your local game warden to get those tagged uh, within 14 days of the close of the season. But other than that, yeah, okay. those, those auctions are awesome. Where are the... Uh... Where are the auctions at? Uh, Cabot might know better than me. It, I want to say it's either Okmogee or Muskogee is where they used to be. I don't know where they are currently. I haven't been to one since I was trapping. That's been some years uh, some years ago. I used to go and tag bobcats at them and stuff, but I haven't been in a while. Uh, I know the Oklahoma Fur okay. Harvesters, they have a, a Facebook page, and they post a lot of content on there, and all those guys would, be, would love to help out at somebody that's young and into trapping. So yes. it, it wouldn't hurt to reach out to those guys at all. We also, it, I don't know if you're familiar. It, sorry, it says March, spring for auction was March 9th at the Okmulgee County Fairgrounds. Okmulgee. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they usually do it closer to the end of trapping season. So your, your furs, you can hold them over uh, and maybe save them for next year. Uh, if, yeah. you've never, if you've never heard of it, Lincoln, there is a actual like a trapping school that we do, a youth trapping workshop. Uh, the, the Oklahoma Fur Bears Alliance and stuff that, that work together on those. And that's a really great experience if you're young and wanting to get into trapping and wanting to learn about trapping. I learned stuff there. Yeah, I've heard about that. It, it's a lot of fun. I would recommend going to it if, if you have the opportunity. That The one that's here, they usually do at Carl Blackwell in uh, Stillwater. Okay. And I can't remember what date we said. Squirrel season opens up May 15th. I, yes. I think that's what you said, but I just want to clarify that. Yes, May 15th. New message. Any recommendations on sportsmen's clubs, hunt clubs for Oklahoma hunting access? <sighs> hunting access. Evan, I, I don't know. Uh, there, there are probably definitely some options for that. That's not near as big here in Oklahoma as it is down in like Alabama and stuff like that. There's Edmonds Sportsman's Club. Yeah, the, the I, I don't I don't have a lot of experience with them, so I wouldn't recommend. I don't know how to recommend you one. I've never used one. Uh, she said there's one in Edmond. I'm not super familiar with. They it. have a lot of land out west because with Olap, I remember um, seeing a lot of that out there. Um, it might just be a, a Google search sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, I I don't know enough of them to recommend them to you. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't. I, I just don't know. I uh, shameless plug here, but um, I always like to promote our con our conservation organizations like National Wild Turkey Federation, Ducks Unlimited, Quail Pheasant Forever, Oklahoma Hunters and Anglers, um, because those are great places to get plugged into to meet people, like minded people, people that um, have properties that might um, kind of take you under their wing. Um, you can really find some good mentors and some good knowledge in those 
in those groups and those um th those chapters local chapters so i would encourage you to check out something local like that uh, everybody here i think you should get plugged in somewhere on the conservation side it just kind of gives you like in whatever area you're most interested in but it um backcountry hunters and anglers is another one that is great as an over art like overall instead of just one one facet like turkey or deer or duck um um, but yes, that's a great way to get plugged into a lot of people. And, and they might actually know a little bit more about those hunting clubs too. So on turkey hunting, um, I shot my first turkey this year. Awesome. Congrats. So thanks. But, uh, I was wondering what calls do you recommend? Whatever one you can make the right noise with, <laughs> uh, it just okay. depends on your comfort level. First turkeys I've yeah. ever called in was just with a box call. Uh, and it yeah, was I like the box call. Yeah, and mine was just an old junky one that, you know, you probably got bought at a garage sale, but I called in a bunch of turkeys with it because I can make the right sounds with it. Uh, you know, really just depends on what you're good at and, wh and what you feel comfortable with. I've heard some turkey hunters that sound really, really good, and I've heard some actual turkeys that sound really, really bad. Uh, so you don't have to, mm -hmm. you know, really critique yourself and be hard on yourself. You just got to get out there in the field and play around with it, and, and you'll you'll know if it's working or not. Yeah, and it may work okay. one time, but not another time. So, yeah. uh, Cabot had another thing about the uh, Fur Bearers Alliance. You can join a membership for that. I've never been to their convention, but I can only imagine it, it, it's a great time. Yeah, uh, Lincoln too. It like I said, if you're a young guy wanting to get into trapping, go into one of these events. There's a lot, a lot of guys with a lot of wisdom that will bend over backwards to help you out and uh, get you some experience with it. Okay. I just mostly been trapping raccoons, Good. stuff like that. I have dog proofs. So. Nice. We need a lot more guys like you out there trapping we raccoons. Do. The we... world would be a better place. Lincoln, teach every all your friends that that want to learn. We need to keep trapping a lot. Yeah. It's such a it's a it's a it's a very small percentage of our hunting population here in Oklahoma, and it used to be a lot bigger than it is. Yeah. That's why those three, you know, they had three auctions, and it went down to one auction. So we really want to see a resurgence in trapping overall here in Oklahoma. And the wildlife department actually has done on some um, trapping workshops at some of the WMAs, and we're doing more of those too. So um, if that's something you'd be interested in, shoot at me an email. It's not just the um, the camp or the the workshop yeah. for the children. It's it's an actual um, workshop for all ages. Yeah. Um, so that's a different type of new, new thing the wildlife department is doing. All right. Do we have any more questions? This will be posted and um, recorded and posted to Outdoor Oklahoma YouTube channel. Um, it takes me a couple of days to get these up because they're so long and uh, I got to trim off some stuff on the front and back side of it. Um, but it will be posted and I will turn around and um, send you guys a link to the direct to the to the YouTube video, as well as a follow up survey um, that you guys can let us know how we did on these classes. And if you guys like these learn to hunt classes, um, please, please, please give us um, some feedback here because we want we do these for you guys so we want to make sure we're covering all the bases um next class will be may 15th and it'll cover squirrel hunting so um it'll be 12 o'clock on um, may 15th which is a wednesday so go ahead and sign up for that one we would love to see you guys there too thank you guys we yeah, appreciate yeah, it appreciate all the support the more you guys support this stuff and give us some combat or comments and feedback the, the more we have a you know reason to do it or you have different class ideas some stuff you'd want to learn yeah. about uh, feel free to share that too we can try to do a class on it yeah i may not know about it he may not know about it but i can find someone that knows about it and can teach it so yep. thank, you. thank you guys all right thanks, have guys. fun out there <laughs>